Welcome back to the main stage. I hope you have enjoyed your sessions and made some new friends through the networking carousel. Now, whilst people are joining us here on the main stage, guess what? I thought we could once again review the world of Twitter and see what people are saying about the last round of sessions. And I should say the tweets are slowing down a little bit. So please do start commenting and use that hashtag. But a couple to share with you, Dorothy. Uh, Tobias says, how can we reach visitors of museums where they are and have two-way dialogue on pressing issues? NHM London and UN Live putting planetary emergency forefront. Use cultural approach to frame the climate crisis. Phrase effects on health and well-being. Inspire, use empathy. Great session, Excite 2021. Thank you, wow. Tobias. Thank you. Lewis, yeah, a great tweet there. Lewis Howe, uh, what are the pressing issues around EDI for science engagement right now? Thanks to all that joined the session. See and add to our discussion here. And he's actually shared a link to a Padlet. So if you want to look at that, please follow Lewis Howe. You can find him at, at FiddleBrain on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Inca has been making cardboard automators made during a tinkering session. So great to see that our tinkerers are out there and making things throughout Excite. And then a bit of a teaser, actually, for this afternoon, something special. So uh, Mr. Bruno is rehearsing for Excite Happy Hour today at 3 p.m. Central European time. Uh, meet him in the Pavilion of Knowledge Booth, hashtag Excite2021. So something to look forward to this afternoon. Thank you, Brad. Uh, now to introduce our final keynote, the inspiring Melati Weissen, I'd like to invite Maria Joao Fonseca to join us. She's part of the annual conference program committee that dedicated a bunch of European colleagues who come together every year to help bring you our conference. Maria Joao, my dear, can you <laughs> hello, please, Dorothy. hello Maria Joao, can you please audio describe yourself to the audience? Yes, I will try to share how I look like. Well, yeah. I would say I'm medium height, average weight with very thin, very straight, light brown colored hair. My eyes are grayish blue. I have a somewhat round shaped face and thin lips, which I tend to exercise by smiling quite a lot. My skin is beige and I'm sporting a flowery uh, rose and red and orange colored dress today. Thank you. That was perfect. It was very you. Uh, and uh, how are you and how are you enjoying the conference so far? Well, so far I'm completely taken over by this conference. It has been wonderful to see everyone in the last couple of days, both during the top quality sessions, which I have uh, been fortunate enough to attend, and also the magnificent social moments. I feel that the Excite spirit is really shining through in this conference, and uh, even though we are in an online environment. And I would like to take the chance to thank you Dorothée and Brad for the outstanding job and the magic you are doing now and also all the people backstage and of yeah. course our lovely participants both uh, attendees and presenters so really really having a nice time and learning quite a lot. Mm, that's great to hear. Now for our audience members please do write any questions for Melati in the Q&A tab and upvote your favorites. Now Maria Joao, I must hand over to you to introduce our very special keynote. Bye-bye. Bye. So for the task I have at hand today, I could not be happier to introduce Melati. Melati Wisen, our third keynote speaker for this year's conference, is a very young and very dynamic change maker. By 18, Melati managed to have single-use plastic bags banned on Bali, Indonesia, where she lives, after having founded the initiative Bye Bye Plastic Bags together with her younger sister, Isabel. Um, aiming to build a future we can be proud of, this leading and eventually um, inspiring climate activist has since then been placing her best efforts in mobilizing other activists, especially among the younger generation. Having started the People Movement, One Island, One Voice, and the social enterprise Mountain Mamas, Melati now leads the Utopia Project. Isn't this such a perfect name, intended to equip the new generation of change makers with the tools needed to take matters into their own hands and accelerate the change we need. 
So do prepare for a very inspiring keynote and one with a very special feature as well. So sharing the stage with Maladi and fueling a lively conversation that will follow her presentation will be the lovely Sophie Perry. With a background on creative science engagement projects, Sophie has been working in evaluation, production, and project management. She has a master's in science, technology, and society from University College London and uh, an undergrad in biology. She's now working in Science Gallery Dublin as a research and learning coordinator. So uh, we're in for uh, a real treat. I would ask both Maladi and Sophie to please audio describe yourselves as you begin talking. And now, without further ado, Maladi, please, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? I hope that you're all feeling uh, energized. I, I, from my understanding, you're at the towards the end of the finish line of this Excite conference, to which I've heard from Maria Joao's uh, recap just now has been a rejuvenating uh, experience. So I'm honored to be with you all today. A little audio description um, of myself, a fun fact, I just finished a very long beach walk. So my hair is a little bit <laughs> greasier than usual from the um, from the, the ocean spray and the sunlight. Um, I'm wearing right now a very wrinkly shirt as well, but it represents the organization I stand for. I have quite curly hair, brown, caramel skin. Um, and yeah, I'm half Dutch, half Indonesian. And so that brings me actually to the first slideshow presentation uh, that I have. And I'm just checking if, if you can see my screen and everything, hear me okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, so my name is Malati. I am 20 years old and a full-time changemaker, as I describe myself. I'm half Dutch, half Indonesian, but Bali-based. I always describe myself as a little bit of a an island baby or an island monkey. Uh, that, therefore, the many beach walks that I do at the end of a, a long Zoom day. Uh, I'm also the founder of Bye Bye Plastic Bags and Youthopia. And today, the story or the narrative that I would like to bring forward is a little bit more about the perspective um, as a young change maker and how I believe that all of you joining in today at the Excite conference can create these spaces that help mobilize more young people to become active change makers in the community. So allow me um, first and foremost, of course, because I just had this beautiful beach walk on Bali, um, I want to bring everybody's attention to the ocean. Why? because I would also like you all watching in, tuning in from wherever you are. I don't know which time zones, for me it's about 8 p.m. at night. So I'm gonna encourage everybody to take a nice, uh, you know, sit back, shoulders back, sit up straight, and on the count of three, take a deep breath in, okay? One, two, three. Take a deep breath in and out. And another deep breath in and out. I like to do this mostly on any stage, every stage that I'm on, because it is a strong reminder that 70% of oxygen is produced by the oceans. 70%, it means that almost every second breath comes from the ocean. So we can begin to ask ourselves, why are we treating our oceans so badly? This was a question I started to ask myself at a very young age. I was 12 years old growing up here on the island of Bali, Indonesia, which some of you may know is the world's largest archipelago. We have only ocean surrounding our 17,000 islands. So why are we treating our oceans so badly? Plastic pollution was everywhere. Indonesia as a country is the world's second largest source of marine plastic pollution. So growing up on the beautiful island of Bali, it was a massive reality. And I'm, I know I don't have to go too much into the, into the facts. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking to, or I'm, I'm preaching to the crowd, right? We all know that if we do not take action, there will be more plastic by weight than fish by the year 2050. We're all aware of the reports that are coming out of the urgency of the fact that already it is proven that every single week 
we are ingesting about five grams of plastic into our systems as human beings. So I'm sure that I'm speaking to the crowd that knows all of this information, so I don't wanna spend too much time on the negativity. But it's important to share because it's a big part of why I got started as a young change maker, right? I told you about growing up here on Bali. Now, when I always share the story about how I got started or why I got started, people often think it's about the uh, plastic pollution, seeing it, feeling it, hearing it, every day, all the time. But the reason why I got started actually was because I wanted to preserve this beauty right here that you see on this image. It's a beautiful green, lush terrace, rice terrace, sorry, you know, which we have many of here in Bali. It was growing up on an island this close, surrounded by this beautiful nature that made me want to protect and stand up against the plastic pollution. And here, this was the reality that we were seeing. So I wanted to share and show a couple of videos uh, where it paints the picture of Bali, what it looks like today. So allow me to move to the next or the first video here. Can you still see my screen? No, one second. Here we go. This is to paint a picture of how Bali looks like and the audio is not important, but just take a look. So as you can see here, it says very clearly that the everything, all types of plastic from that one video of this diver right here on Bali was swimming amongst all of this plastic debris. Another image video that I wanna share just so that you understand the visuals of just how drastic, just how urgent this issue is, not only eight years ago when we first got started, but even for example, this video that I'm about to share of 2019, recently what happened with Kuta Beach, a local beach here on the island of Bali. Take a look at what we saw here. So we can see that plastic here in Indonesia was a reality that we could not escape. It was simply everywhere. And so at the age of 10 and 12 years old, let me share my screen back, we had to decide which Bali we wanted. And as you can see here, it was really that contemplation of do we want to preserve and protect that beautiful green, lush rice terrace image postcard picture perfect Bali, or were we going to let our island drown in plastic pollution? So we made our decision, and here's a picture of me and my sister on our very first day of the mission at 10 and 12 years old. We started out Bye Bye Plastic Bags, which was the first NGO we started with the pure vision of a plastic bag free home. And let me tell you, we did not have a business plan, we did not have a strategy, 
but we had that clear vision where Bali would become plastic bag free. And wow, what a journey we have been on. I'm now 20 years old and still actively on the front lines making this vision happen. Let me take you through a little story. One of the first, first key things that we have learned is the importance of collaboration, right? That we need all levels of community, of society to come together for this mission or for this vision to really come true. Collaboration is key. And so we mobilize a lot of different sectors within our community locally here on Bali to start this movement of Bye Bye Plastic Bags to become where it is today. But keep in mind, and here's a picture of us at a trash fashion show. Yep, you heard it, a trash fashion show. We kept things creative. We kept thinking outside the box. And that's unique to our generation as well when you think about it. We have an abundance of creative ideas because we know that we cannot be too uh, we cannot exclude mu too many people and we have to keep things fun. We have to keep things creative. And so trash fashion shows in the early days was definitely a fun way to get everyone involved. Creativity, again, at the core of everything we would do. And suddenly from the island of Bali where we started Bye Bye Plastic Bags as you know, a social initiative, as a youth-led movement, suddenly everyone or every young person in all corners of the world started to reach out. You know, they saw what we were doing, what we were achieving right here on the island of Bali. And they said, hey, I want to do what you're doing. And that is where today you can find Bye Bye Plastic Bags in over 60 locations in 30 countries globally, all led by kids in middle school, high school and university. And so what we've now become is really Bye Bye Plastic Bags being this living example that kids can do things. Kids can stand up for something they're passionate about. In 60 locations, we're active with youth-led teams. And so this is actually personally one of the most proud achievements that I have and where we closely monitor everything and all the cases that are happening globally. But still today, no matter where we are in the world, oftentimes some of the biggest challenges or excuses, can we say as well, we always hear that are always the same from government or corporates. The first one being that the people are not ready for change, simply not ready. Another one is that alternatives are simply too expensive. This is true in the short term, but in the long term, we know that the degradation of the environment that the cost to tourism, especially here on the island of Bali, people do not want to come back when they see polluted beaches. People do not want to come back to visit Bali anymore once they've seen the high risk of plastic pollution. So in the long term, it's not too expensive. So third, uh, the third um, excuse or the third challenge that we always hear is that more research needs to be done. As a young change maker, right, the perspective that I share today, I truly believe that yes, more research needs to be done. And yes, the investment and the um, capital from government or from top down need to be, uh, you know, channeled into those that are doing the research onto the front lines. But we already know enough to start taking action today. How much longer do we need to wait for another trash emergency? How much longer do we need to have uh, to wait until we take action now? And so, you know, despite all of these excuses, despite all of these challenges that we kept hearing meeting after meeting, whenever we tried to convince those in leadership positions to make a difference, to make a change now, we kept on going. And this was one of the core elements of the work that we do with Bye Bye Plastic Bags right here on the island of Bali. Persistence and commitment is key. I remember learning for the first time the term walk your talk. And boy, did we learn what that really meant. Persistence and commitment is key. So we kept on going. We kept picking up the phone, knocking on doors, showing up at meetings, and making sure that our voice as young people were heard. And six years later, Bali officially banned single-use plastic bags, straws, and styrofoam. And this was a huge celebration for all of us, part of the movement. Uh, there were so many like-minded people and individuals, uh, organizations, grassroots uh, teams that really celebrated this proud moment of Bali becoming plastic bag free.
But we knew that our job was just beginning because writing the law and implementing the law are two separate different things. And so today, our work fully focuses on implementation. And we've learned a lot, something that normal textbook can never teach us. At the young age of 10 and 12 and starting a movement, what we've learned is the importance of teams surrounding yourself with the right type of people around you to take an idea into reality. The fact that true collaborations and having a real sense of purpose in anything and everything you do is so important to making you establishing or reaching your goals. Another very strong lesson we learned is that community-led change is already everywhere. It's already happening. We know we cannot wait until implementation of laws. We know that we have to start taking matters into our own hands. So community-led change is already here. And the last but not least, we need to urgently accelerate positive change and the way that we're able to do it or the way we believe through our lessons on the front lines we're able to accelerate that change is by empowering young people and this leads me to my next and where i hope will inspire you um, in this presentation is that you know throughout the eight years i've had the immense privilege to speak to over 500,000, half a million students in all corners of the world no matter what background no matter what language they always had the same question. And that was, how can I do what you do? You see, our generation or the generation I'm a part of knows their why. It's the how. How do I speak in public? How do I reach out to my government? How do I make an impact? How do I research? How do I get these change maker skills that the current textbook does not provide? And so that's where our newest project, Youthtopia, comes in. We're not a school, we're not an institution, but we're a community-centric platform, a youth-empowering ecosystem where we work together with frontline young change makers, and that you can see from my <laughs> background right here. I have a wall full of incredible young change makers where we work together with them in our circle of youth network to build out peer-to-peer -peer programs. Right? Youthopia, different than Bye Bye Plastic Bags, focuses not only on the plastic uh, pollution space, but on all the 17 sustainable development goals. We believe in a world where every young person can be a young change maker. And I would like to share this quick video with you now. Let me just stop sharing my screen and open up this other tab. And so there you could see a little bit about, um, you know, the vision of Utopia. It's been an idea in my head for so long of how can we really create this space and this place for young people to come together and learn from each other about how to make an active impact in their communities. And so that's where Utopia comes in. I think, you know, we launched in 2020 at the beginning of the year because we thought no better year than 2020 to get started. And <laughs> another <laughs> big lesson that we learned is that, yeah, you know, 2019, the year before, even before the pandemic, was one of the years where we saw the biggest rise of young people um, stand up for something they believed in. But after the protest, after a social media campaign, they would start to ask themselves, what now? What next? And Utopia is that answer. It's how do we create that long-term sustainable change? And it's all driven by young people, for young people, with an incredible track record and network of our circle of youth. So I encourage you to use Utopia as a resource for your students, for the young people in your networks and communities. One of the biggest um, drivers of our programs is our masterclasses, which now I would like to share another quick teaser uh, with you as well now. 
And I will also remember to add share audio. I don't know if that worked the last time, but here we go. It's a quick teaser of our signature programs at Utopia on our learning platform, our Utopia Masterclasses. Hi there. Hi. Hello. And this is your Utopia Masterclass. Throughout the journey, we were always asked the same question no matter where we were. And that was, how can we do what you do? And that's why we're here with Utopia, making this masterclass for you. My name is Malati. And I'm Isabel. My name is Faisi Manjimba. My name is Mohamed Jinde. My name is Jerry Benchigib. My name is Clover Hogan. And this is your Utopia masterclass. So there you go. You can see already the energy, the excitement of Utopia comes, lives and breathes through the knowledge of frontline young change makers for the rising young change maker. And that's what makes Utopia so special. Um, going back here to my slideshow presentation, another fun story, uh, you know, with Utopia is that um, for the last eight years or so, uh, well, not Utopia, but Bye Bye Plastic Bags and my general story of being a young change maker. It, it's all started in my living room, right? With my parents' house and whatnot. And um, now we have this headquarters space uh, made up of five recycled shipping containers, solar powered. Uh, we have a permaculture garden out front and it's an absolutely incredible start to the headquarters of young change makers globally that we wanna establish through Utopia. I think my closing message uh, before we start with the Q&A and it's my most favorite part, uh, I, talking and sharing and exchanging with, with the audience. But I think my closing message and, and my takeaway that I hope you will have or take from this message is the fact that I think really right now, 2021, we know we're on a timeline for change. We know that by 2030, we have to achieve the 17 SDG goals. So one, create the spaces and encourage young people to be part of anything and everything that you are doing from the very beginning, not only at the celebratory uh, stages, not only at the announcements, but really include us in every chance that we are able to uh, be a part of. Because truthfully, the time of inspiration only is over. And in including young people. Again, at the beginning of my speech, I shared my belief that if we do empower young people, we can accelerate that much needed change. And sometimes it's just about encouraging and providing that space where we're able to feel like we have our voices heard, where we can go out there and learn from our mistakes and then just get better and better from there. That's the experience that I was, uh, you know, had a privilege to grow up in that area and that space and why I am the person I am today. So um, with that, I just wanna say thank you very much to Excite for having me. I hope my story as a young change maker, my perspective as a young change maker on the front line gave you a fresh new insight and I look forward to the Q&A and please reach out if there's anything that I don't get to answer during the Q&A. But Sophie, over to you. Hello. Thank you so much, Malati. That was, I was nodding along here. I could see myself backstage just nodding to everything you were saying. So thank you so much for an amazing speech. Um, I better just audio describe myself before we get started. Um, so I have shoulder length, bit longer than kind of nondescript brown hair. Um, I've got pale white skin. I'm wearing hoop earrings um, and a stripy white top and a Apple earphones that I'm talking to you through. Um, I also just wanted to remind everyone, I can see some Q&As coming through in the Q&A tab, so that's great. Um, keep them coming and also keep upvoting other people's. Um, and there's also going to be two polls in the poll tab. So please do vote on those polls and we'll visit them at the end of the conversation. Um, I am here to, I guess, facilitate a conversation between Malati and the Excite community. And I'm really excited to be able to do that. Um, so Maria introduced me. I'm the Research and Learning Coordinator at Science Gallery Dublin. And as of this year, I'm also a PhD student exploring environmental education for young people at King's College London. Um, so I'm going to be, I can see some Q&As coming in, but I'm going to be very selfish and ask a couple of my own questions first. Um, so Malasi, the first thing I wanted to ask you is about your journey and and you mentioned the length of that journey you know setting out to ban plastic bags on an island when you're 12 
and then that taking six years on the one hand wow amazing what quick political change but on the other hand that's half of your age when you set out to do that and it must have felt like such a long time and you talked about the need to be resilient the need to keep asking the need to not give up um but i just want to ask were there times when you ever felt is this going to happen did you ever lose hope and how did you get through that and i, I think i mean this specifically with bye bye plastic bags but also generally when we're talking about climate activism, climate change, and addressing environmental degradation. Change takes so long, but it's not necessarily a luxury that we have. So how do you deal with that? And how do you come out with your positivity and your change in the face of what might feel difficult sometimes? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a that's a fantastic question. And I think also it is a, oftentimes when I share the story in one go and I'm in, on a roll with the presentation and whatnot, I'm, I get overly excited about what we've been able to achieve and the potential of how we can actually scale change makings for such a positive impact that I forget to mention the hard work that it, it entails, right? And it, we touch on it with the persistence and commitment you know, that yeah, as teenagers, instead of going to the movies, we'd be going to beach cleanups, we'd be going to get signatures on our petition. It was a lot of hard work, it was energy, um, a lot of time commitment. But I think uh, one of the most frustrating points, hands down, is exactly what you just said, right? The fact that change is happening too slowly. But I think that this is also, I, now as a 20 year old, it, it's become a really big driver for why I keep doing what I do, because I know exactly that we do not have the luxury of time. It means that all the more we, we have to be doing as much as we can right now to make sure that we are reaching the goals that we're setting in place, whether that's with the Paris Agreement, whether that's with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, these cannot be voluntary commitments. These need to be mandatory, legally binding commitments from governments, from corporations. And if that's not happening from the top down, how can we start implementing that from the from the grounds up so I think the way that I kind of keep up or keep going is kind of remembering and reminding myself that it's not about me it's not the fact that one person can create change it's not about the fact that one organization or there, there's one magic solution out there it requires a lot of people a lot of different types of solutions to match up this puzzle piece uh, and this path forward to a future that we're proud of so I'm very serious about change. I'm a very serious 20 year old. Yes, I know I'm on a Friday night at 8.30 p.m. on a conference call with all of you, but it just, it's again, this deep, deep understanding that we don't have the luxury of time right now. Everything happens, good and bad, in our lifetime. And we get to decide where we go. Awesome, amazing, yeah. Pat, like, I, I completely agree. Also, thank you for being here at 8 p.m. Um, <laughs> well done, Malati. Um, so, but yeah, that idea of believing that it's not about you and thinking that there's this collection, collective action that's needed from the bottom up, but also from the top down, um, and maybe how those interact a bit, brings me on to asking you about Utopia. Um, and I just think that lots of people in the audience will be so interested to hear a bit more about this program and a bit more about how it works. Um, the themes, looking at sustainable development goals, empowering young people and looking to them as bringing valuable, valuable insights and resources to tackling climate change is, I think, something that the science engagement and science communication community is really looking to at the moment. Um, so I wanted to ask just a couple of questions in terms of these. I get the idea that it's very implementation and project focused. So these young people who you work with through Youth Youthtopia, do they come with their own projects, which then you like facilitate and empower? And, and also, do you have, are there any that you're really excited about so far that have come out of that project already? Yeah, so um, it's my favorite topic. I graduated a year early to become a full-time change maker, but secretly and mainly uh, focusing on building out this company of Utopia, which is an education or action-oriented education-based company um, and the young people that you were talking about is right here behind me it's the circle of youth network and they all have their own existing projects and they can be focusing on any uh, field any kind of industry whether that be access to education whether that be climate change whether that be innovation science right really they have to just 
to be on the circle of youth, they have to have their own project and their own track record of change, right? Locally, globally, on whichever scale. We have really change makers that you may know from like headline news, but we also have change makers that you've never heard of. And these circle of youth members, they work together with Youthopia to build those peer-to-peer -peer programs, right? So they are the ones that are leading, curating, uh, writing the master classes. They are the ones that you can sign up for an informal mentoring session on our learning platform. So basically what Utopia does is kind of create this space where uh, what we hope to do is create more of a stronger sense of role models, right? Where it's the same age as the young person who's saying, I want to make make a change too, but I have no idea where to start. And instead of waiting until they're at university where they can you know, study all of these amazing, cool studies that are now existing, but in middle school, they can already get started and the place to go is Utopia. And we're not a school, we're not a university, but again, we're that youth empowering ecosystem where we show how it's been done, right? Really focusing on that how, that strategy of how to become a change maker with the rising young change makers. And this is all currently available learning material wise on our learning platform, which is our website, utopia.world. Amazing, yeah. And I think everyone in the audience will be so interested to check that out later and have a look. Um, so your approach in Utopia, um, I'm sensing this idea of network, it's unlike any other education system that I know of right now. Um, and that makes me appreciate, I guess, you. so you told the World Economic Thor Forum in 2020 that the education system is outdated and it doesn't prepare us for what we, what we need to be doing as young people now. Um, and I have to say that my experience in formal education somewhat mirrors that as a young person, I can totally see what you're saying. Um, and so obviously one of those solutions is people like yourself and networks like Utopia. But what other solutions do you see in terms of we have we have education systems and how, how can they change as well as other things outside of them supporting that change? Look, I think Utopia is just solving a pain point of right now. My hope is that, you know, yes, Utopia will take off. It will become that headquarter space, but it will also serve as an inspiration for the traditional education CV or curriculum, right, to change, to show governments, to show uh, the industry of education, no matter in what field, whether that's high school, middle school, or, or even like places like museums, that these spaces where we foster young creative minds, where we encourage learning from failure, where we encourage going out there and having hands-on learning uh, experiences, I hope that Utopia can inspire the traditional uh, methods to adopt that as well, right? Because it, it's the only way forward. And I, you know, I, with my background as well, I went to um, the green school here in, in Bali and that, you know, opened doors for me and my sister to really create and shape our own education mixed in with, you know, my background of being half Dutch, half Indonesian, two complete different worlds mushed up into one. I, it's, all so much about how we create these spaces at a young age for mm. young people to be able to be part of the solution, which we're always now demanding young people to get involved. But if we're not providing the how, if we're not inspiring and sharing the techniques of how, you know, how can we expect young people to be, you know, encouraged, motivated, instead of falling into a downward spiral, which we already see happening into eco-anxiety, into being overwhelmed, into not knowing, again, where do I start? And that's one of the first questions that we address here at Utopia. Exactly, yeah, and, and all of the things you've talked about. So the keynote yesterday, um, John Falk was talking about how science centers, science museums, places of wonder and amazement when you're a young person can really stick with you for so long throughout your life. And for you, that, that wonder and amazement came from Bali, came from the place that you grew up in. Um, and I think just for everyone, everyone listening and everyone watching, working in a science center, working in a museum, like we can be the spaces of wonder that show how amazing the world is. If, if you know, Bali's not on your doorstep, but instead you grow up in a city, then somewhere that you can, where you can see what's possible, I think is really important. Um, and I'm, I can see lots of questions gonna, coming in. So I'm gonna go into the audience in just one moment. Um, but I wanted to ask you, how important science and science communication has been for you in your work 
And that might sound like a loaded question because this is a conference of science communication and science engagement professionals. But actually, I think it's really interesting, especially with a topic like climate change and environmental degradation, that it's so cross cutting. Like how, how much of your conversations hinge on the science, this is what's happening, and how much of it hinge on like political systems, social belief, cultural practice, um, and, and how do you pull all of those together? This is such a real, it's a, such a good question because <laughs> oftentimes, you know, I, I get excited about this because it's at the end of the day, what it is, the crisis other than the climate crisis is a communication crisis. So many times we box or categorize, you know, environmentalism as this, uh, human, uh, social work as this, uh, science as a totally different branch either. And there isn't this like tapestry where it's all connected. So for me in the work that I do every day, it's like, how do I translate the science and the statistics and the numbers and the, you know, uh, reports that are coming out you know, where I have access to it on my internet, on my screen, how do I translate that and story tell that into communities? Exactly. You know, and that is that is also the role of young people that we have here. Almost every single one of the circle of youth members that I come into conversation with, the, the real work is about how do we bridge that communication gap, right? How do we make sure that uh, we're leaving no one behind with this knowledge? Because I think the work that you do as scientists, I will never say that I'm a scientist or a researcher. What I can do really well is storytell. What I can do really well is bridge that and make sure that everyone feels as connected as possible to the issues. So that's my strength as a young change maker and that's what I know. But I also know that my storytelling, the impact to the person that I'm storytelling to would never be there without the importance of science and the facts that are all, like what, what's being found today. So. It's something that I use every single day. It's what we have to, as young change makers, always be up to date to ensure that we're um, storytelling and mobilizing and organizing uh, with the most relevant news and updates. Amazing. Um, so there's a question from Iona in the Q&A, um, which has been upvoted by 30 people. So I'm gonna go with that one. And it also links to a question that I wanted to ask you, so that's ideal. So Iona wants to know, how can we support young people? What do they need from us? And is that a physical space? Is it about skills? Is it media office? Is it platforms? Um, and I think this is maybe an interesting question because a lot of the time, especially I'd imagine with something like Youthtopia and your work is inspiring young people. It's telling young people what they can do to be heard. But now we have we have a captive or captivated audience of people who have positions in museums and galleries and spaces with platforms. And actually, yeah, how, how do they change? How do we need to change the adults, the grown ups to listen to the young people and the next generation that are so important? Well, uh, another amazing question. Thank you, Iona. I think if I got the, if I remembered your name yeah. correctly, but um, I think, you know, it kind of answers itself. Uh, the first thing to do when you want to support young people is actually instead of finding the answer yourself is actually asking the question in the first place uh, because it's I, I can't give you that answer even for myself there is no copy paste solution even that's one thing I learned immediately off the bat with growing that global movement of bye bye plastic bags in 60 locations 30 countries it's case by case. So really understanding the specific needs by having a conversation, by asking the questions to the local youth group about how and what, where your skills, where your strengths as an adult, as an older person, as a CEO, as a general manager, as a scientist, as you know, community leader, where, where that applies uh, best for young people. Generally, a lot of the time or a lot of the uh, common answers that you will find are linked to resources like funding, capital, uh, like resources or access to knowledge, mentorship. Sometimes it's just about having an, uh, you know, a moment to pick your brains for a specific skill and providing that mentorship being accessible to young people. Um, so there are lots of different, different channels. Yeah. And, and you've mentioned mentorship, actually, which is going to bring us right on to our next question. So Margot says that young change makers can also inspire older change makers. Any thoughts on intergenerational mentoring from the young change makers to the older generations? The change needs commitment from everyone. 
Yes, it does. Um, I This couldn't be more spot on with what I was just thinking about sharing. Um, <laughs> You know, next to our circle of youth, which you see behind me, we also have our circle of wisdom. And this is where, again, Utopia acknowledges the intergenerational uh, collaboration that is needed if we want to see change, right? It would be pointless if we as young people started to point fingers. I think we saw a lot of that, for example, in um, in COP21 even still, when, when we were, you know, the Paris Agreement and everything. I remember being there as a 15-year-old and feeling so conflicted as to where I stood as an activist because we were pointing fingers. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's That's not going to work anymore. We know that now. 2021 has brought this um, feeling that, you know, again, collaboration is key and that means intergenerational change. So next to our circle of youth, we have our circle of wisdom, um, but even more so where, you know, I, 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 I love the part of the question, you know, of where how can um, the older generation even learn from the younger generation? Utopia, we have a tailor-made program called Control Alt Delete, and this is where we do a uh, package uh, where we have a core group, a handful of young Gen Z leaders, uh, creating a program of about two and a half hours for um, the older generation or C level. Uh, people, part of a corporation, part of an institute, and we just take them through the experience or through the updates of how we as young people see or feel uh, what could be done better. So definitely lots of that happening. Uh, intergenerational collaboration is the only way forward. Yeah. And, and this idea, I think you mentioned, you touched on it earlier, the idea that youth need to be engaged, like youth need to make the change, but it, you can't just hand over these problems to youth. Like we need to work together. Um, and I think that sounds like an, like an awesome way of doing it. Um, okay, next question, again from Iona, but she seems to be speaking for the crowd because she's getting lots of upvotes. Um, so Iona wants to know if you feel that the pandemic has negatively influenced things. So like maybe the return of plastic bags. I don't know, for us, there's a lot of disposable masks often on the street. Um, and even coffee coffee places no longer accepting, I suppose, reusable cups for hygiene region, reasons. Um, I suppose there's one way that the pandemic could have influenced things like that in terms of waste, but also in terms of priority, I suppose, and in terms of firefighting. So governments, politics, addressing COVID-19 first, and then climate change mm -hmm. is just gonna have to wait till next year. Is that is that something you've noticed? Yeah, definitely. Oh, where to even begin with this question? It's such a it's such a big question that has so many or deserves so many different um, pinpoints of like attention. But in, in terms of the plastic crisis, especially here in Bali, one of the immediate things we've seen is that you know the ban on plastic bags came in officially in. Um, it was my mom saying bye. I'm still at the office and she was like, I'm going home. I was like, okay, bye. <laughs> um, no, but uh, so, where was I? Uh, plastic crisis, yes. Yeah. The ban came into place in 2019 and uh, immediately, almost overnight, which was a huge celebration, we saw you know stores being like, we don't give plastic bags anymore. There's no plastic bags anymore. Thanks, keep bringing your own bag. But then six months down the line, the pandemic hit and we almost saw an instant, immediately, uh, five steps back sort of feeling, right? Where suddenly there was this narrative, not proven at all, but this narrative where, uh, you know, if you had single use plastic, it'd be uh, less likely for you to take uh, contract the virus, uh, you know, stay away from things like glass or reusables. And so bam, plastic was back like never before. And so that implementation, that education, that uh, upkeep of conversation is, is required more than ever now and you also see that globally that conversation of hey don't forget about single-use plastic it's still here it doesn't stop because the pandemic stops but it's um yeah I, whereas I do see a big downside I also see a huge upside because we're now we're, we we see what our governments are capable of we see that the, these changes almost instantly almost overnight globally mm -hmm are possible for something like the COVID-19 crisis. So what if we applied that same energy, that same power, that same capability to the climate crisis? It's just the fact that now we need to start behaving and acting like we are in a climate crisis and making sure that it has our full attention and full priority. And I think unfortunately that that still takes a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. Um... 
Exactly. And all that all that money that uh, appeared immediately to solve the COVID-19 pandemic, where, where has that been and when will it emerge for climate change? I completely agree. Um, OK, we just have, I think, time for a couple more questions. Um, so there's an interesting question here that asks, um, that asks about the role, I guess, the role of um, the role of gender in climate change. So Simona is asking um, whether you think women have a more active role in change rate making and whether they feel more responsible. And the reason that Simona is asking that question is because she says, and I have no idea how her eyesight is so good, because she says most of the people pictured on your background are women. Um, but I can't see that, but. Well, it's, <laughs> Simona, it's exactly how I was going to respond to your question by saying that actually, like 99% of our circle of youth are actually female women, young, young female leaders. And even with Bye Bye Plastic Bags, our 60 teams, almost 98% are led by young girls. And honestly, I don't know, it's, I, uh, have an interesting relationship with this because when I started my activism, you know, I never, I mean, I was really lucky, really privileged to grow up in, a, in a, an environment where my parents never put that, you know, girl, boy privilege uh, on, even though I'm half Indonesian, which there's so much work here in Indonesia to do regarding the gender equality. But my parents said, go for it. If you believe in something, stand for it 100% and go all the way. So I did that, me and my sister both. And when we took the international stage, it was the first time that I heard, it's so inspiring what you're doing, especially because you're young girls. And um, I don't know, I didn't. I never paid attention to that and it just showed even more, it put it even more of a stronger passion to making sure that every young girl feels empowered and has that opportunity to, to stand up and have a leadership position. So we started a bunch of different programs and initiatives. We started a social enterprise that empowers local women to produce alternative bags and earn an income for themselves. So lots of different uh, trajectories that led me onto the how can we empower more women? Because yeah, I believe definitely that uh, we're going to rise out of this crisis through female leadership. Amazing. And yeah, I mean, Simona, well done on identifying those pictures. I clearly need to go for an eye test. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then I think we'll revisit the results of the poll that we sent out. So thanks to everyone who's voted and remember to vote if you haven't yet. Um, so my final question is kind of looping back to the start a little bit. Um, and I want to ask you about hope and about faith um, in, 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 in the future, I suppose, because so often and you know researching for me my PhD in environmental education a lot of it is spending a lot of time reading things and panicking and worrying and thinking this is terrifying um, and that fear can be really immobilizing like you mentioned eco-anxiety um, and so yeah how, how do we keep how do we remember that we can make a change and this is okay and do we need to give ourselves space to kind of to feel that worry and to feel that panic because sometimes I think the fact that it's so worrying makes us try and ignore the problem and sometimes that's not useful how, how do you deal with that oh well i think it's always i i remind myself that it's good to feel that sense of you know uh, i don't know this pressure tinkling in the chest uh, even it's the same thing as like going on to stage if you're gonna you know if some of you are nervous to speak in front of an audience uh, you know you get those butterflies you get those shaky knees i always remind myself the day that I lose those butterflies or the shaky knees is the day I know I need to stop doing what I'm doing. It's the same thing that applies to the climate crisis. We know the urgency. We need to feel that in order to find the the, the person who we really want to be. I think, you know, it, it challenges us as a global community to decide, okay, which path are we going to take towards a future we're proud of? So, yes, there needs to be more space. There needs to be more... Um, just conversations that are held where we can go through this emotion together because climate anxiety is a is it's rising we're seeing so many young people at a younger and younger age experience this emotion and we're not having a safe enough outlet and it 
leads us to not doing anything. It leads us to believing that we cannot do anything. And that is the worry, most worrying phase. So for me, um, being in this space, the way that I kind of keep hope, the way that I kind of keep going and waking up every day, coming to the office, making, mobilizing, organizing, is actually a really hard lesson that I had to learn the hard way, but it's celebrating the little steps, celebrating the little victories, understanding that each one of their accomplishments is our accomplishment, but each time that they achieve a goal, a policy change, another uh, girl getting access to school, th these are little victories that we need to also acknowledge just as much as we acknowledge the fear and the eco-anxiety that we're experiencing. Yeah, that's such a great message. And I think one of those successes in this sector for Excite is that we have taken the time to have a keynote that is entirely about cli addressing climate change and being active. And most importantly, that it's been led by a young person who is already making this change. Um, it's been amazing to hear from you, Malati. Oh, Brad is here, so I think we have to finish. But Brad, can I quickly share the results of the polls? <laughs> Absolutely. Quick. Okay. So I just want to say that 97% of you who voted don't think you're doing enough to address climate change. Um, and I just think, yeah, okay. So if we feel that way, let's just use this speech as a chance to think, okay, I have a position of power. I am, I am a grown up. I have, I have things at my disposal. I maybe run a museum. I can do something. Um, so let's use the speech as a chance to do something. And I want to say a massive thank you to Malati for being so inspiring and sharing her knowledge and her experiences. Thank you very much for having me. You're so welcome. Thank you for thank you for talking to me. It's been great.